Look at me. Hey. hey. We've, like, hey. We've, we've had many times where we forgot to push record. So I hope uh. that doesn't. All right. Where, what Welcome. Over here? What's wrong with my... Um, we, we just lost we your... Lost your. There we go. Okay. The magic there is being revealed. Go. Here we go. Perfect. Ooh, cool. Perfect. Now, can you... Bower, when you try to change slides, what happens when you do that? Can you try to change... Because I have it right now set to my my screen, like I have like eight slides in a row. Look okay, at that. Now, now you're at static slides, right? Okay, so it's, that's, that's fine. Static slides. But if I go to, watch me, if I go to the first one, then here, mm. this is now animation. And then watch, here we go. Now it'll play the movie. Watch, here we go. And it'll play the movie. See? Can you guys uh -huh. hear any music, anything at all? Uh-uh, not here. No. Not, not right, yeah. I don't think mm -hmm sends that sends the uh, I don't think mm -hmm sends the um, the mm. audio over, but it's okay. I, I can I can get to there fast enough. All right, so Bora, you're you're you're. I'll put it back on the static slides. That way you can control it as well. Welcome, students. Right. Come on in. I, I think we have 54 folks here. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you all. All Let right. Me, let me see. I think Bora, your host. I don't think I can change your name. I can. Okay. Uh, I need uh, to change it myself. Okay, perfect. Our faculty candidate is coming to give a talk this week. I'm excited about that. That's a, that's an exciting case. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Mm, yeah, I'm also looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, we'll get started in, in exactly 10 seconds. We'll get rolling. Here we go. This should be really fun. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right, 410. Wonderful. Welcome everybody to CS62NC Week 6, Digital Systems and Boolean Logic. Woo! Great to have you all here. Great to have you all here. We've got our wonderful guest already here welcoming uh, Voskum Sophia Shao as our, as our faculty guest for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, here is our brief agenda. So we're going to welcome you to Week 6, do a complete, com quick, a quick computing in the news. Uh, then we'll interview Sophia and talk to her about some of her research and some of the exciting things she's working on and where she sees the space. Um, we'll, then we'll let her take her leave and we'll go back to our week's plan uh, and then have some whatever announcements we have and then we'll do the ask us anything at the end of this. Perfect. All right. Bori, want to take us into computing the news? Sure. Am I pinned? I need yeah, to get feel myself for, yeah, feel pinned. Feel free, feel free to pin yourself. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, pinned. There we go. Hopefully this works. Okay. So you. Um, so we we have been saying that now this it is a really exciting time to be in uh, chip design in in computer architecture in general uh, because we are entering this uh, era of domain specialized computing and the first thing that is really has shaken up things is uh, this need to support machine learning machine learning at a large scale. Uh, so we are seeing, um, you know, there are two things that uh, people need to do, two, two ways how people need to support machine learning. One is training the data. The other one is running the inference on the trained data. And there has been a number of companies now that have built custom chips for that. And in this picture, um, there is uh, there are two uh, clips that uh, we took from uh, something it's a conference that is called Hot Chips that was held in August uh, about a month ago, uh, where some of them have been presented some really exciting chips. So Google talked about TPU V2 and V3. That's their tensor processing unit that they're using to accelerate training and inference in the cloud. You know, TPU is what processes when we do speech recognition or many other tasks. TPU was what uh, uh, beat the Go Master, uh, and it was an older TPU. I think it might have been either TPU one or two um, that beat him. Um, uh, AlphaGo, uh, I think, is the name, right? AlphaGo was the name yeah, of the Alpha software was running was, over was, there. Exactly. Um, you know, they don't publish these as they make them. Uh, so we believe that TPU3 is probably about two years old now. There must be TPU4 and TPU5, but they talk about uh, um, and the, the stuff that is uh, already deployed. There is another crazy chip that uh, Cerebras um, has presented. 
and uh, it is in their second generation. You know, when you build uh, a chip, um, you know, they, they built something that is called a wafer and wafer is like this, it's 300 millimeters um, size. But, you know, when we take our chips, we dice that wafer into tiny, tiny pieces. So if you look at the cell phone, uh, cell phone chips, like um, the ones that um, Apple makes are seven by eight millimeter. So they're called dies. So this whole wafer is diced into seven by eight millimeters. If you take a desktop PC, they're maybe, you know, 15 millimeters on a side. Some really big server chips are like an inch on a side. Um, like a, po a postcard size, basically. Yeah. Uh, not a po it's a stamp size. I meant a postage stamp. I said, I said postcard. <laughs> yeah, I meant to say postage stamp. I meant to say stamp. <laughs> yeah. I know that it's a postage stamp. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, yeah. this is a big deal. The larger area you have, the, the worse yield you have, the higher chance there is of imperfection on that. So you really try to care about having the smallest area as possible to have the highest yield from a, a yield means the number of good, good chips you get out of a, out of a total slice. Yep. Yeah. Um, and this place, Cerebras, is building chips that are the entire wafer. So they are 300 millimeters on a diagonal, which is insane. Why do, why they need these big chips? Because they want to do training for machine learning on them. Those things have to be pretty pricey, but they're really hoping to make it in there. There is a number of other companies that have their solutions. Uh, people might have heard that Habana was acquired by Intel. Uh, then there is a few more startups and some of them have already gone down, uh, uh, but the new ones are, are popping up. So this is an exciting field of domain specific computing that is creating a lot of interest out there. Um, so speaking of that, uh, can we have, uh, can we switch over to Sophia? Let me jump over. Yeah. Uh, Sophia is a new faculty in ECS that is really focusing on this, on specialized architectures for oh. computing. Uh, so she graduated uh, from Harvard in 2016, and then she spent a few years in industry. Uh, she worked in NVIDIA, uh, and NVIDIA is the leading place that has been selling these more general purpose GPUs for uh, machine, for training and inference in machine learning. Um, and last summer, she joined Berkeley. So welcome, Sophia. Hello, everyone. Uh, and we, is it okay if you ask you a few questions? Uh, maybe you can tell us, how did you get here? Um, you know, how did you end up here? And let's try to put us Let's try to. Pin did you here. always know you're going to be an academic? That kind of question, like, how, how did you even find <laughs> find your way to Berkeley and all those decisions you had to make? Yeah. Ah, uh, that's those are really good questions. So first, good good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you all, and uh, really good to uh, thanks Bora and Dan for this wonderful opportunity to get to interact with all of you. So as Bora mentioned, I'm Sophia Shaw. I'm an assistant professor here at UC Berkeley. So how did I come here? So I grew up in China. I did my undergrad in uh, Zhejiang University. It's a, a very uh, uh, university in the southern part of China. And during my undergrad, I got really interested in basically microcontroller programming and FPGA. And I participated in the embedded system and the robotic competition during the summer before my senior year. That completely changed the way I see hardware and software and the way I see the possibility in this area. So after that competition, after that summer, I decided that I want to learn more. I want to do grad school. I want to know more about computer architecture and hardware design. So during 2009, I decided, okay, I want to do grad school. So then I moved to Boston. I did my PhD at Harvard, uh, working on thinking about hardware design with a special focus in uh, domain specific accelerators, understanding the challenges with Moore's law and Denner skating, I assume you are already very familiar with that. And then thinking about what we can do in the hardware space to further improve the performance. So after I finished my PhD in 2016, I, I was also thinking about, okay, whether I want to do academia or industry. Back then, I really want to, I already interned at both Intel and IBM before. I see a glimpse of how industry works, but I wanted to see more to really actually build something 
uh, in this area, and this is a very exciting area, especially thinking about the amount of effort in both academia and industry. So uh, since I have already been in academia for a few years, so I decided to, okay, let's move to industry to see what people are working on there. So that's why I decided to join NVIDIA after my PhD and I spent three years at NVIDIA. It's a really exciting time. As Bora mentioned, there are a lot of efforts in thinking about hardware design, especially for hardware for machine learning. So I was at NVIDIA Research uh, where we are also very interested in thinking about what's the hardware, what's the hardware implications of supporting all those important emerging machine learning applications and what kind of optimization that we can do, not only in architecture, but also in circuit, maybe even underlying device that we can do to improve the performance. So I was there for three years uh, with wonderful mentors and the colleagues and worked on a couple of very interesting um, product, projects to actually build the hardware and see the implications uh, and also the possibilities of hardware for this area. And uh, two years ago, I think that's roughly when we just finished your tape out, we finished the breakout process and our trip worked. And that got me thinking, okay, what's my next project? What do I want to do next? I think that's when I started thinking about okay, what, what about academia and whether I want to not only uh, build a course, cool and interesting projects, but also interact, interacting with students, both undergrad and grad students to really impact the next generation uh, students and also hardware engineers. So that's actually one of the major factors. I decided to move back to academia and uh, I'm really glad that I'm here at Berkeley with wonderful colleagues and the students. So it has been an amazing year, the past year, but I'm looking forward to interacting with many of you uh, in the future. So I guess that's how I got here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great. That's so wonderful. I, I, that's have, wonderful. I have a question, um, another question. So how does one become a faculty at Berkeley? I mean, Dan and I, I think forgot uh, what does it take. It, it has been a while. It's 20 years at least for both of us. So yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a yeah. good question. I also try to forget about that. So it's still pretty fresh in my mind. Uh, let me refocus this really quickly. Um, that's a good question. So how to become a faculty at Berkeley? So. So first, uh, you need to get a PhD, uh, typically for most of the cases, at least uh, some grad, uh, grad degree. I, I want to say that this is a really good time to think about uh, going to grad school. Maybe like at first, if you are not sure, maybe try out master degree first, maybe also eventually get a trial of the PhD program. This is a really interesting time. We definitely see a lot of exciting areas in both hardware and also applications. And there is a strong demand in thinking about new innovative ideas in those areas. And a lot of those ideas actually coming from academia who can actually uh, like stay a, a little bit away from like the practical, very near-term deadline pressures, but really thinking about what are the major problems, what are the big concerns, what are the things that we really need to think in five years, maybe even 10 years. So this is a really good time to think about uh, grad school. So to become a faculty at Berkeley, uh, typically uh, you need a PhD degree, I guess that's a step one. Second, I would say you need to do, or all, all of us, we really need to think about not only internal research. When, once you get into the grad school, you start thinking about research and then develop your own research taste and also develop your own project. I would say one thing very important in thinking about uh, becoming, especially a Berkeley faculty, is the impact of your research. Sometimes it's very easy to get lost because, oh, I want to publish more papers. I want to uh, like get N papers in like N years and hopefully that will actually make my research stand out. But most of the time it's not about uh, the quantity, it's really about the quality, especially for institutions like Berkeley it's really important for, for faculty members and also for grad students, like for, for all of us working in this area, not only just thinking about how many papers we publish, really thinking about what kind of impact we make for this area, for Berkeley, for our research community and for the entire society. So I think the impact driven way of doing research is actually really important. I would say that's definitely based on my experience as someone who goes through the process and interact with uh, all the Berkeley faculties and the mentors, 
and also seeing different uh, career paths of, of colleagues and mentors. I think having an impact driven uh, research mindset is really important uh, in, in, in overall your, your career path, no matter whether you come to Berkeley or go elsewhere, really think about your impact of what you are doing instead of just some quantifiable metrics. Uh, I guess the last thing I want to say, especially become a faculty at Berkeley, this is partially, like I mentioned earlier, partially the reason I decided to, uh, when I came back to academia is to really thinking about interacting with students, both undergrads and grad students. And also this is something I, I observe here at Berkeley is that to be a, a faculty member here, you really need to care about teaching, care about mentoring, care about advising, because we spend a lot of time interacting with students, both undergrads and, uh, and grad students. And the reason we are here, instead of being elsewhere in the industry where that can be a very a well paid job, is really the benefit of interacting with the younger generation and see what we can do to actually learn with them together and to, to as I mentioned earlier, to do high impact research and to impact, to change the field. So having a strong drive and also care, and caring about students, both undergrads and grad students, I think that's also a very important factor. Oh, that's my understanding. We also have two other faculty members here. I think it'd be interesting <laughs> to hear their perspective as well. I've heard that on your second point, uh, in terms of just not just number of papers, but actually impact of papers, I've heard the analogy made, don't just get singles. So this is the baseball analogy. Don't just hit singles and get on base. Try to swing for the fences. Try to have a couple of home runs in there to make make a difference. So I appreciate that. And I agree with that, that being the thing that's most important. It's just a, not just paper trail of like, well, I did 100 papers, but nobody reads them. It has to, if I did three papers that everyone reads, that actually has more impact than the 100 papers nobody reads. So that makes a lot of sense. Right. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, speaking of that, uh, um, in, you know, this Boolean logic thing, the mapping of Boolean logic onto gates and, and, and switches uh, that Dan mentioned was invented by Claude Shannon. Claude Shannon, one of the best known electrical engineers and information theorists, didn't publish many papers. I mean, <laughs> the, uh, because, you know, he only went, he only went for the big stuff. No question for that's Sophia. That's actually his master thesis. So he did yeah, that. Yeah, that's his master. master thesis. And if you watch today's video, if you watch today's video, I say that today in today's okay. video. Yeah, so. exactly. Now, uh, a question for Sophia. Um, mm -hmm. um, tell us something about your research. So how, how, how to swing for the fences in this, uh, uh, in, in this domain. <laughs> Right. Well, that's a good question. So as Bora mentioned, I'm really interested in domain-specific hardware. And Bora talked about some of the really exciting de developments in the industry these days uh, in thinking about hardware for machine learning, uh, which is a uh, very important applications in the industry today. And it's really exciting to see not only this new development from uh, traditional hardware companies, but also startups uh, and also software companies like Google. So we definitely see a lot of excitement in this area. So definitely we are really interested in this area in thinking about understanding applications behaviors and explore different uh, uh, hardware acceleration strategies. Specifically, we have three focus in the way we think about this uh, hardware for machine learning research. The first one is definitely related to individual algorithm acceleration. What are the emerging algorithms? Bora mentioned their training and inference, and even within training and inference, there are different networks, different applications, and there are also emerging algorithms showing up on a daily basis, maybe even on an hourly basis, in actually important play a very important role in, in the machine learning process. So we are definitely really interested in understanding the application behaviors and also explore potential hardware mechanism to make them run more efficiently, especially in power constrained devices. So that's the first uh, angle. The second one, uh, what we are really interested in is also thinking about not only individual accelerators, but how those different accelerators work together. So we talk about the importance of having domain specific accelerators for those emerging applications and they all have different behaviors. And we'll see all the different applications 
and the accelerators need to really work together, uh, uh, especially in today's complex SOC, where we have all the different, like 30 or 40 different accelerators, they need to interact with each other and the passing data from and to each other. So how to actually make sure they can coordinate in a consistent way and also achieve performance and the efficiency benefit is also very important on our agenda. So we talk about individual accelerator and also how they work together. And finally, I think another area we, uh, I, I personally always have a soft spot on is really thinking about from methodology point of view, how we can from thinking about so all the different efforts need to pour in to design and also specialize different applications on different hardware platform, what we can do in the methodology space to help designers to navigate this space and make it easier and also more productive to, to design new hardware. I think those three directions are what we are really interested in and also actively working on, thinking about accelerator, individual acceleration, system integration, and also design methodology here. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, what's your opinion about these these two chips that we have shown, the TPUs and and uh, Cerebrus? Is they're in your space, are they? Mm -hmm. Right, that's a good question. I think, as I mentioned earlier, first it's really exciting to see the development from uh, like non-traditional hardware vendors. So we see most of the time when we talk about hardware designs, Intel, AMD, IBM, and the, the NVIDIA. Those are basically the major players. And it's interestingly, although everyone is actually participating in the machine learning space, the two examples that were mentioned earlier, one is from Google, which is actually more software company. Uh, and another one is actually from a, a startup, Cerebras. So I think the area is getting really interesting in these days with not only uh, participation from major hardware vendors, but also from new players, both uh, traditional software companies and also uh, startups, uh, all of those, all of them actually are participating in this uh, hardware for machine learning design. So I think one thing definitely stand out in both two examples that Bora showed earlier is the scale. So both the Cerebras chip, we talk about how big it is uh, and the, all the different components they need to actually work together. And also the TPU V3, a lot of the performance uh, is actually on multi-node, hundreds or, or even thousands of nodes. All of those need to actually work together. So definitely we see a lot of the, um, the, especially the emerging training accelerators turning some, some, in some way similar to HPC problem where not only we need to design each individual node very efficiently, but also need to think about how the different nodes actually work together in a consistent fashion. So that's definitely very important these days in the hardware for machine learning space. At the same time, I mentioned both two are mostly like training and large scale. We also see really exciting development and like in the in the edge space where like low power uh, low power devices, even microcontrollers, how could they actually potentially support efficient machine learning algorithm? Mostly, of course, in the inference space. That's also very important. We also see a lot of uh, a lot of development in those space. So we definitely see. Maybe one is the scale, especially for the training, the large scale data center scale, and another one is actually for the edge devices under extremely conditions. How can we actually design more efficient uh, hardware in those scenarios? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. I, I, I have a quick question. Yeah, I, I, let me let me just add something here. Kath, when Kathy Yella came to visit us, she said that in most in most of the HPC applications, high performance computing applications, they noticed that. Um, they were not processor limited, but they were I/O limited. So I/O, this moving data around is the most costly thing they've noticed. As I did, you know, a, an audit of where 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 time is being spent. Just moving mm -hmm. data is just remarkably expensive in terms of time. Are we seeing that as much on the TPU? You know, a, a, a million nodes of TPU v3. Is it really that's where the, the, what's like what's the bottleneck? I guess in these new domain specific architectures. I guess that's the mm -hmm. question. That's a good question. I think first, it, it really depends on the, the applications. Uh, so in this particular case, a lot of training applications is still pretty compute intensive in the sense that we talk about the compute to memory ratio that like Kathy and uh, Patterson, they used to also use the roof line model to quantify that. So a lot of those uh, compute kernels, they are indeed very compute intensive. So there is significant compute actually going on in individual nodes. But once we especially look at some of the ML perf uh, results, 
where we are basically competing to see the best performance that we can get. What's really interesting in the sense that, of course, the easiest way is basically scale up to any, like uh, as many machines as possible. There's no limit in terms of the number of nodes that you use. You could use as many nodes as possible. But typically, the reason all those different hardware and software vendors stop at a particular node is because it doesn't scale anymore. If we see the reports of say, oh, we reach that we use 2,000 nodes to reach this performance. The reason they don't use 4,000 nodes is not because they don't have 4,000 nodes. It's because when they actually further split things up to 4,000 nodes, it actually they don't get better performance. So for those extreme conditions, we definitely see, given the application have so much actual compute to memory reuse, we already see some of the compute bound scenarios showing up when we look at this kind of machine learning space. Yeah. Very good point. Mm -hmm. That's great. Amdahl gets us in the end. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, where is that? Where is Amdahl in here? Exactly. The students don't know that yet, but they'll, they'll yes. see it. They'll, they'll see it in a couple, a couple of weeks. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I, a question. Quick question for you. Um, you teach uh, one fifty one. Can you tell us mm -hmm. something about that? Uh, you know, can you put a little advertisement for that class? Um, okay. About I think about ten percent of this class are going to wind up in one fifty one. So well, tell well, us, you know, why should they do that? Why should they? <laughs> yeah. Of course, I heard you had more than 1,000 students this year. So we should be expecting a lot of students coming to 151. That's wonderful. So yeah, I teach 151, which is Introduction to Digital Logic and also Integrated Circuit. It is a intro to hard, well, not necessarily intro, but definitely thinking about digital design and also hardware design where it's, as the name suggests, it's an EE and the CS course, which it actually truly brings electrical engineering and also computer science together. So in this course, you will actually see not only uh, how to actually map your program to the different instruction set, and but I'll actually build specific hardware following uh, like specific ISA specifications so that you can actually build your hardware either in Verilog or ASIC to have uh, something actually fabricable in the hardware in the end. It's also okay if you have a more EE background. I think I assume for this crowd, most of the students have more CSE background, but you will also learn actually a lot of EE concept where you how we actually build register file, how we actually build ALU in hardware, how transistor actually behave, how can you assemble different transistor together for all the different digital logic. So you will actually see the entire stack from I say to hardware implementation and to see how the transistors behave. It's also that's this really week. That's this week. Okay. You, just you just advertised for <laughs> why the students should watch this week's lectures. Very I love important. it. That's thank you so, thank, this week. Thank you mean, so much. This is great. That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So this week, yeah. so it sounds like this week will, will, will be very important also for 151. So after you see the entire stack in 151, you will actually build real hardware. In either FPGA we mentioned earlier, that's a very cool platform. You can actually prototype different functionalities onto the board or using ASIC flow, which is actually pretty close to the state of art commercial flow that is able to actually eventually build, tape out a chip in the end. So that's a really cool class covering a lot of hardware and also hardware architecture details and really useful for any hardware engineering career that you're interested in pursuing, no matter whether it's in industry or, or academia, it will enable you to build, actually physically build any type of hardware that you're interested. And it's also a very hands-on class. We have a very important lab component. You will actually go through the lab, go through the lectures and go through the lab to see how the different things actually mapped uh, in hardware. So it's actually a direct follow-up of 61C. You see all the different components in 61C and you will go a little bit deeper to actually see how we turn all the different concepts that you cover, sounds like this week, into hardware. Mm -hmm. Actually, this week and next week is yep. what we, we yeah, exactly. That's where 51, 151 starts from, from mm -hmm. you know where we leave it off in about a week or so. Um, how is uh, 151? I mean, there is a hardware component. How is that going online this semester? Is it yeah? How, how are you even working with the online <laughs> space? I mean, students used to be stuck in the lab, you know, the digital lab for, for hours. How do they do that at home? What's, what's the equivalent? That's, that's a, those are very good questions. So that was also our major concern, uh, especially starting during the summer when we start preparing this class. 
So first we have a wonderful uh, team of teaching staff. Uh, our GSIs are wonderful. They put in a lot of time into this. One thing we did do is early in the summer, we like, as they mentioned, there is a very strong lab component. So we do want to see and still experience lab, uh, even we are in this uh, virtual world. So we starting in the summer, we already reach out to students for students who are interested in FPG lab, we basically ship the boards to them. So they actually have a set of boards that's required for them to, um, to do the labs. And our teaching staff also figure out basically two ways of programming the so FPGA either through a remote access with our, uh, our inst inst instructional servers or a small uh, virtual machine that they can use to actually load their program onto their FPGA. So instead of relying completely on the instruction servers as what we did before, students can actually create local setup on your laptop actually to program the FPGAs directly. And second, for students who are concerned about so FPGA lab and also the, the, the physical, uh, physical interactions, we also set up a really smooth ASIC flow where all the lab component and also project components can actually be done completely remotely because we, as long as we provide remote access. So uh, we do have also a record, record high number of students actually being enrolled in the ASIC lab. So compared to the FPGA lab, you actually don't need anything on your end. As long as you have your laptop, you can actually remote access to our instructional server. You can actually go through the same uh, very important design principles directly on your end. So I think that also alleviates a lot of students' concern. So we are still halfway, uh, less than halfway through the semester. We finished four labs, so still two more labs and the project to go. At least so far, so good. I think the team of GSIs are very important way, all of us pouring a lot of time to interact with the students. So to get questions answered and uh, holding live uh, labs and also finding a personalized way to interact with the students. So, so far so good, we'll see how this scales. And we did during the summer process, we also figure out a way actually to use AWS to actually program FPGA. We didn't end up pursuing that route in the end, but if the remote instructioning become a new norm, I think that would also be very useful for classes like 151. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you, you for all your hard work to, to, to support our, our students who are all all around the world taking these Berkeley courses. That's Thank you so much for that that work in there. I see two yeah, questions in the Q&A. Bor, do you want to jump on those? Or should I yeah, why, don't you, why don't you read them? Yeah, why don't yeah you sure. Read them? They, I thought they were very good questions. So Simon asks, how do you know when to make an accelerator for specialized applications? Uh, for example, <laughs> if, you make, if you make a chip for speech recognition, another chip for other things, will you have too many specialized chips that are performing worse than a single generalized chip? What, what's the trade-off there? That's a really good question. I think that's also very important uh, in, in basically in the past 10 years when people start approaching the accelerator design, people have started thinking about hardware accelerator, like hardware accelerator is a not new idea, right? I'm not sure whether you folks cover floating point in it. Yeah, floating here. point coprocessors, 6881, exactly. 6881. I remember that <laughs> one well. <laughs> exactly, that's basically the first accelerator. I, I yeah. was one 87. of the first. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's basically one of the first accelerators that we built. Basically, a functionality that may not be required for all the applications, but may might be actually very important for a subset of applications. We are interested in thinking about hardware mechanism for that. So it has been going on for a while. It's really interesting how machine learning actually completely changed the landscape. Uh, that really actually make it very very feasible actually for a lot of companies. We see all the amount of activities going on here um, to, to think about specialize it because there is a huge market, a lot of use cases for it. So I think to Simon's question earlier, uh, to how we actually decide to make an accelerator for that, I think partially or unfortunately, <laughs> they're largely a mar market decision or application decision where we really need to think about what applications are really important that can actually reach to a large amount of market. So this is more like we talk about hardware architecture is really thinking about architecture is something in between. Think about application and also think about underlying device technology. So for all the students who are interested in hardware, always very important to see the application trend and uh, what kind of what patterns, what kind of behaviors of applications are getting uh, important. 
So I think that's one of the reasons, one of the very important factors in thinking about the accelerator. At the same time, another important factor in thinking about what kind of component can be accelerated also depends on the application patterns. If like it's really nice for machine learning in the sense not only it reaches so many different applications uh, areas, but also in thinking about accelerator patterns, it's actually perfectly perfect for hardware acceleration. And one of the reasons to make actually machine learning so widely used is actually when it's mapped onto GPU or graphic processing unit, it actually reach a pretty impressive performance. Even GPU is actually not designed for machine learning. So we also, of course, I mentioned earlier, there's a marketing reason for like market reason for that, what application has a bigger reach. And second, there's definitely also uh, technology and also uh, hardware reasons in reason here in the sense kind of what kind of application behavior can be a better fit for hardware acceleration. And certain applications, uh, especially uh, regular applications like machine learning have very regular access patterns and not very straightforward control flows and also very regular memory accesses. All of those patterns are very important. So we think about application also need to look for those patterns here. Mm -hmm. I think there's also the domain issue. You've got, like, think about Alexa. Alexa has to make a determination locally without going to the cloud. Did you say the wake word Alexa? But then after you say Alexa, it takes what you'd say and sends it to the cloud. So how much has to be done locally for any particular application versus has to, could be done by, you know, millions of machines waking up doing something like a Google search or an Alexa NLP problem mm -hmm. and coming back. Can you wait that little half second for it to go to the cloud and come back? The cloud, the cloud is amazing. So how much has to be done locally, you know, at, maybe at the edge versus being done at the system core level uh, up, up in the cloud? Right, second right. question, mm -hmm. the second question, uh, what aspect of the R&D that you do applies only to the, uh, to, to the domain of, this is Benjamin, by the way, to the domain of machine learning. So of the R&D you do, how much of it is just machine learning specific? Because it's such a big problem and you're trying to carve some kind of a hardware solution to that versus what you're, what you're doing is generalizable for approaching mm -hmm. the general problems of domain specialization. So how much is machine learning specific? And if it weren't machine learning, nobody can use it. But how much of it actually could be, how much of your own research and development can be used in other, in other applications? Right, this is also a really good question, um, Benjamin. So I mentioned earlier, thinking about both application, how we can actually build specialized hardware for it. And second, really thinking about system integration, how we can actually tie different accelerators together. And finally, thinking about from more design methodology perspective, how we can actually improve the design process. I would say maybe the first one is more tied to specific algorithm, but the other two are more generalizable in thinking about like things like Simon mentioned earlier, you will actually have different accelerators, how we actually use them efficiently and how we actually integrate them uh, together. And finally, in terms of design process, whether some of the methodologies or design process that we use for machine learning accelerators or thinking about machine learning applications can, can also be useful for some other uh, application domains. So on this point, I also want to I just read the full question from Simon earlier in terms of how this will be actually used for other specialized nodes. I do want to actually encourage you to think more instead of building application specific hardware or ASIC, what we used to call, uh, which has been also around for a while. I think I would, we, would, we, we do need to emphasize on the domain specific part uh, instead of application specific part. In the aspect of domain specific, we're not only thinking about, oh, we accelerate this one particular application that only work for this this particular piece of code, but really thinking about what are the common factors across this domain and how that can actually be, be, uh, be uh, uploaded onto hardware. In some sense, if you see some of the trend or patterns in the software engineering field, when we are actually building a lot of domain specific platforms like, uh, like PyTorch, TensorFlow, and also other platform in other application spaces, we do see more this kind of domain specificity coming up, not only in hardware, but also in, in, in software space. And that domain knowledge should be also be transferable, uh, depends on the use cases here. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you, Sophia. Thanks for uh, visiting us over here. And I, I hear that Sophia is 
relatively new, so she still takes on undergraduate students. <laughs> she, she, she doesn't yet know how to say no. So you know, that's <laughs> yeah. the, maybe that's I should start learning that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, it's so, way too yeah. easy to say yes to everything, and next thing you know, you can't you can't breathe. So so make sure you, take yeah, take time for you, yourself, Sophia. <laughs> thank yeah, you. And and but you guys, while still while she's still taking students. <laughs> <laughs> go, go. <laughs> pounds, All right. pounds, thank pounds. you thank you so much Sophia Thanks. great to see you thank folks you. look to her hand you. thanks again everybody thank thanks again thank you. wonderful wonderful that's great feel free All to head right. out if, you, if you'd like you to wanna... okay. yeah I'll, yeah, I'll take, take it over care. perfect perfect yeah, I'll All pin right. you. I'll pin you. All right, here we go. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to show you if I yeah, pin me, give me a pin and then I'll, I'll jump in. Here we go. I'll pin you. Okay. Your no, pin. it's it's the spotlight actually. The pinning is just for your own thing. It's the spotlight is the guy. Yeah, I tried so, to give you. I got, I got, I got, I got. It. There we go. Okay. Right. So we did this. We did this. I wanted to show. I wanted to show you this, which is we didn't get to show this interesting. I, I shared this in CS10. This is this just came out. I think this is like last Thursday or Friday. A drone that flies inside your home. Think about privacy implications. We try to do computing in the news. Um, this is. I guess the idea here, just to set, set this up, set the context, if you didn't have a camera on like every window, if you only had like one main camera for your home security system, only facing out or facing your door, but you had all the windows of things and you heard something, there's something that happened, you know, like somebody rattles a window, you didn't think about it, somebody would break into your side window. Let me just show you this. All The, the only sound of this is like some, some, there's nothing, there's nobody speaks of this. It's a 30 second video. Let me just show you this really fast. And here, boom, boom, boom. So here's this, the drone wakes up, you get an alert, something's in your house, and then you can control the drone. The drone tries to find toward where the sound was, but I think you can also control the drone as well. And by the way, I was told that not everything you're seeing in this video is a real shot. Some of it's simulated. So somebody's just walking around pretending to be a drone. They haven't perfected it yet. But the idea is you'll have this drone that you can either control to see if well, there's a sound downstairs and you get a notification of a sound downstairs from your security system. Uh, and then you'll you'll figure out you'll you'll figure out uh, what to do, whether you can fly it yourself or not. So I, I found it fascinating that anybody would buy this. <laughs> this is just me because uh, they've already shown that you can hack the uh, I think. I forget what it, what particular system, whether it was an Amazon or a Ring or who, who was driving this, but they've already shown you can hack the the cameras that are at your front door. Uh, there is a, it's very easy to get access to that, to that video data. Uh, and so you can imagine if that's easy to do that, then you can get access to this drone and fly it around the house in the middle of the night, including you know when you don't want to be, when you're not controlling it. So I would, like, I'm the last person. So I recommend, Think twice before you, number one, put your front door lock. There's a whole digital front door. That's the last thing I would put as digital. Things can be hacked like crazy. Don't put a front door lock. It's just me. And I wouldn't put a, a drone that can be flown around and watch me when I'm in the shower or something. So don't, don't do the, either of those things. All right. Um, yeah, I, I, an interesting thing about this. I bought a, a light bulb about uh, I don't know, a year and a half ago that is also has a speak, built-in speaker. And oh. I looked at, uh, you know, I... I, I, I Tend to probe into these things before uh, you know actually installing them and yeah. it saved a password is plain text so anybody <laughs> who has <laughs> yeah sometimes the security yeah, system isn't done so break, well break into that but they get password to your wi-fi uh oh. I mean, they get access to everything in your house oh. for that. so yeah watch oh, out for God. this kind of watch thing. out folks all right yeah. we do want right. to share we do want to share uh where we are in our schedule and then also share any announcements we have so here we are looking at the schedule. I just finished this whole weekend. I was locked in my basement making my movies and then sitting in my computer doing all the post-processing. So hopefully you uh, get access to them. I think we posted them piazza already. So SDS, yeah. State, Logic, and Logic They're Blocks all are all out there. All the clicker questions are out there. We tried to make clicker questions that would be, you know, really not just pedantic. Did you watch Minute 35? What color shirt was he wearing? But, you know, what's, are, do you understand the principles behind it? So I actually try to pull some old exam questions and try to throw them in here. So actually some of these are really good questions in here. So I thank Stephen for some of the questions he contributed and, and for other folks. So... We're deep in the digital logic world. I love it. There's a whole new field. By the way, this is a great, I want to make a point. People know this. 
if you're behind in 61C, like I'll never catch up because it's all continuous, you can jump in. If you're behind watching the lectures, you can jump ahead to be caught up in this module. This is really important. This is why Bora, I think here is shown different colors in the in the graph. That's really important because if you're all, let's say you're two weeks behind. This, by the way, happened two years ago and, and a year ago. It's always been the case that some students get behind and can't, can't catch up. And it's hard. The workload is hard. We're going to talk about workload in a second. But one of the things that we want to make sure we let you know is that what we've got is, and let's, let's make sure we are clear about this. These modules are independent. So yes, they all are softly relevant and it's great if you saw this stuff before, but you can restart on a new module and be com comfortable with this. So 928, uh, this is Monday, uh, SDS. If you were behind, just, just catch up for this section. And then you can, you know- Just one correction, I didn't update the dates. Oh, we, we oh yeah, the, sorry, sorry, sorry. The, yeah, yeah, so the dates Okay, are, thank, thank uh, you for that. These, yeah, these are the older dates from, from, from before. Dates, yeah. Yeah, don't we panic. added a couple don't of days. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't panic. We'll fix those. Um, uh, so let's just make sure you guys know what the, what the section is. And then right after this, this is critical. In these two weeks, you will know the entire bottom side, but all the hardware level that you're going to know need to know below that, which is great. We get into caching after that. So that's really great. Um, this all this information is all needed for, and you see the colors. Board did a nice job of showing the color connection here. So the yellow stuff is needed for homework four to A. The lab this week, some time to catch up, which is great, and work on your project, obviously. Um, homework five and lab five are this week. Um, this is for, sorry, next week, next week. Orange is lab five, uh, homework five, and lab five next week. And the red stuff is for project three, which is gonna be really fun. And many people, by the way, think that project three, the, the processor design is the most fun project they've taken in this course and in many other cources. I still hear from people years later, I still remember the 61C processor design. So make sure uh, you, you focus on that if you're thinking about ever designing a processor and hardware. That's the, for some people, that's the most fun part of, of this material. So jump on that when it comes next week, excited about that. So, so if you, just a few few notes about that. Exactly sure. as Dan, Dan said, uh, this is a good week to try to catch up. Um, we, you know, there are many things that are independent here, but um, the red part is tied to the orange and the yellow. Um, so the the yellow uh, the the orange part is relatively independent. You 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 can just come from outer space and listen to Dan, and you will pick up the the digital systems over uh you know over the next week that's but true they, even, they, even if you didn't know any risk five or c you can just jump right into to today's lecture that's exactly yeah. right now when we get to the red part and that's going to go for five lectures um, in a row these five lectures are going to um, uh, uh, they're basically a complex digital system a really complex digital system that we're going to build based on the principles that we have um, in in orange in the uh, SDS module, based on the specification that we have uh, developed in the yellow module over there over these uh, seven lectures or so, so we'll basically take all those instructions and implement them using the principles that we have learned. It's really fun, uh, uh, interesting thing uh, when we uh, uh, with uh, Sophia. We, you guys, those that go in 151 will actually do it um, again, but now in the language called Verilog and realize it in something that will look like a real ASIC or, a, or put it into an FPGA and then pass um, RISC-V compliance tests. This year we have changed the project a bit. So you pass some of those tests. So there are not very many hidden tests, but we can add more hidden tests if you want to. Um, so it, it, it's quite exciting. I mean, you do get the functional core this time around that can run assembly, can even run C, compile C. Uh, next time around, you can actually build it if you take 151. Back to that. I, no, it's great. I mean, what's really fun about this 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 series of lectures, I, the, you know, the orange to set it up, the red to actually take it home, is we're going to build a working Risk Five machine. That's it's amazing. I mean, we're not we're not physically building it, but we're going to build a machine that if you could send it to somebody to do this, this would actually run the machine code. And I mentioned this in the lectures, run the machine code you've compiled to some of the link down to. So all that ones and zeros in the, the machine code, we're going to build a machine to do that, and that's what's going to happen in the next sub, several sub lectures after this. It's very exciting. And by the way, Bora, I think it's. Six lectures, so it's, it's a lot of time in your in your basement studio. Not five lectures, it's six. Right. And then we're not, we're not going to build. It's like three lectures to build the machine. Here's the thing, and then three lectures to make it faster. And so using some principles that I'll teach you in this orange section called pipelining. So that's 
the exciting piece of that. So think about that. But it, even if you didn't make it fast, if you skip the last three lectures, you'd still have a working machine just a little slower. So you know what? We can make this faster. And you have three lectures to make it faster because this, this course is also about performance, which is exciting. All right, here we go. Now we got some, we got third perfect, three minutes for two announcements. Announcements, announcements. Uh, we just released a workload and wellness survey. Just what we mentioned it last week, but we finally fi finished it today and we launched it today. And already the numbers are pouring in, already telling us many things we knew uh, in terms of how many. So please do fill this out. It's on Piazza. Um, and I'm already seeing numbers of, I can just give you a, a mostly, I, I'm seeing, I don't want to, you shouldn't. You shouldn't uh, sully a survey by giving some results, but I'm seeing that it's great to see these numbers. Um, and it's, I'm, not, I'm not pleased with the numbers. I'm, I'm hearing people are really struggling out there uh, in terms of emotionally uh, and exhaustion wise, and the number of hours people putting in. We've got to also take a really deeper dive um, on, on our workload in 621C. It does, by the way, the goal of 61C is to not be more than 12 hours a week times 15 weeks. And sometimes what happens is it's more average. Your average per week is higher in the first bit and then lower later. So if it, if it all, we tell our TAs this, sometimes around midterm week, it's going to be a crazy amount of hours you put in. But as long as it's average to what you're being paid for, that's reasonable. So these numbers are going to be high. But hopefully when we do our midterm survey and then our final survey, it'll all end up showing uh, showing that we kind of, it averages out to 12 hours a week. And if not, we really need to go back to the drawing board and figure out what, how we can make this lighter, a lighter weight thing. And thank you for, so much for all the suggestions of how to do that. So there's a, there's a point to ask. In the survey, we ask you any policy changes we've, you know, you remember that last week we made a ton of new policy changes, hopefully try, try to address this, more slip days, more, more flexibility here, more base for project two, et cetera. We'll, we'll continue to look at policies we can do to help with the workload and wellness issues we can. That's part one. Part two, uh, quest retake. In fact, some folks have said, I don't have time for a quest retake. I'm just being barraged with workload. I, I don't have time to take more hours to study for it and to take more hours to do the retake. The idea is you're not supposed to be studying for it. You're supposed to just do it again. So don't count that into what hours you should have. Just, just jump you back in there. But we're going to try to reduce the number I mentioned last week, the people who are going to need to take that. Um, and what we need to do, first of all, my TAs tell me there's, a, there's, there's an order to this, there's logic to this, which is process all the regrades. Now the students know what their final grade is, and now you know do they need a retake or not. Um, so we can know who not to who not to bother again with all this. So we're going to try to slog through, I think, Bora, the number I heard was 350 regrade requests. And we've got two TAs processing this. I mean, two star TAs, but still, I, I mean, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't budget for 350 regrade requests. Usually that's not what we get. We usually get ah, 50, 100, not 350. In which, in which each of the 350 requires us to look at their code, figure out why does it not do something and how can we give you points back? So we're, the, the perspective that we have from the top is how can we get you points back so we're going to spend some time thinking about this we're not going to both slam you on a quest and then not give you points back but we're going to see how we can do this and how we can you know maybe fix a bug and then does it does it pass some tests okay get those points maybe get ding for the bug we had to fix that kind of thing so we'll but hopefully you gave us code that worked i mean hopefully you didn't just give garbage code and it, we you know it didn't work at all hopefully it worked on your system if it worked on your system but doesn't work on all then that's there's some mismatch we obviously try to do, get down get down to the details of that and again, we're going to try to endeavor. So because they were working on that, that's probably all this week is working through the regrades, slogging through that, then doing an analysis of who didn't have a video that worked and figure out who needs the exam, blah, 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 blah. That's probably, so all this is probably going to happen next week. So again, we're just pushing this off. So don't worry about it for now. Survive your project to work on that for now. And then we'll probably do this. So again, I hope to have better a better answer for you next next week once our PTAs have told me that all the regrades are done. But we want to give a due do, do justice to all the regrades, but it does take time. And so the, please, please do... Uh, Please do recognize that we're working as hard as we can. Uh, I'm survey almost done. Responses and, and they're very informative. Yeah, very. Thank you. And please, Pat, tell your tell other classmates. I only I'm only looking at here at 230. There's more than 1,200 in this class. So please, please do make sure all your classmates. And by the way, I believe this is due in two days. It's due on Wednesday evening. So please do serve that. We're going to read the whole survey, and we'll even share the we'll share the results next week. Actually, to to have a conversation about what policies will change. Uh, but thank you all for that information. The survey isn't much. You just a couple of clicks, a couple of clicks, and feel free to type. You can type a lot if you wanted to. We'll have some open fields for you to type some stuff. But if you don't want if you don't have a lot of time, just click the buttons and then and then give it to us. But please do give us some feedback if we can for that. Thank you for that. I think I'm done, Bora. I'm done with this. We're already over a minute for by a minute and a half. So I want to thank everybody. I yeah. think let's thank Sophia for her guest uh, appearance. That was wonderful to have her here. Again, thank you, Bora, for 
for the for the week for the for all the good work you've done and good luck with seven seven straight lectures in your basement <laughs> i know i know how long it took me to set up for those four lectures there it took me a full oh, week yeah. of just editing slides so i i wish you good luck i, with I am <laughs> i'm editing so i'm still editing slides i didn't like the the technical quality of the or the oh, presentation boy. quality of the of, of the last time the, what yeah. we had yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it takes a long time. I may, I appreciate yeah, it. this takes forever. So we'll try to, yeah. to get that done. Yeah, what am I seeing here is what, what am I learning from the survey is that the people on the average um, are spending uh, maybe two and a half hours more than what we expected, which. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing too. Yeah. More. Yeah. Uh, but the tail is huge. We have a really, right. really long tail. And we yeah. need to figure out how to get this. Uh, um, get some um, support guess how do you get yeah. support for those people who, who i mean yeah. a lot of times you could be stuck for 10 hours on the same bug i mean that's just that's a wasted 10 yeah. hours that's not that's not a useful yeah. 10 hours so that's it there is a question about uh, whether we have office hours this weekend i think both of us have office hours mine yeah. is on on wednesday yep, totally. and, and yours i think board is on thursday or friday, friday. which one friday I have yep. a friday in, in this in this lecture and we may re, yeah, during this, this time yeah. the way how we do this we may start running a more of like reviews and so on but this week right. are just regular drop-in for the office right. hour. Yeah, and, and my, okay. I've been mostly, I've been taping mine and I've been mostly doing kind of exam reviews. So every week, I'll, so this week we'll actually take a look at some SDS stuff uh, and maybe even some from risk five we didn't finish last week. So I've been trying to go through old exams to do that. So come to my office hours. If not, I'll try to upload those videos so people have those as reviews. Wonderful. Thank you, Bor, for a good week. Okay, Thanks everybody thank for coming in. Thank hey, student folks, we'll see you later, Thanks. folks. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye everybody.